So the Midianites absolutely controlled the Israelites at this time. And it says that whenever the, um, the Israelites would try to plant a crop, they would come in and destroy it as soon as it was sprouts. You know, they were just keeping them under. People were actually hiding in caves. And we'll get into that in the text. But the Lord chose this unlikely man, Gideon. And if we go through this, we'll see the dialogue and the back and forth between him and God that caused him to grow in his faith. And by the end, I mean, this guy is like another Jehu, completely fearless. And we'll get into that toward the end. So let's just start in the scripture, the life of Gideon from fear to faith. And we'll just start with the text in Judges chapter 6. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds, which are in the mountains. They were living in caves, hiding from the Midianites. That's how bad it had become. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, and Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Here, right here, it says why they were in the situation that they were in. This first verse, that it, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. When your life is nothing but hardship for seven years, I'm not saying that the, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, but if you've got major issues, if you're under oppression for seven years, you might start examine, examining why you've got so much evil and trouble in your life. Amen? Now, I'm not saying it's always. You can't look at somebody that's having a hardship and saying, you must have evil in your life. But I'm telling you personally that um, if it's major like that, if it's insurmountable, you might start examining if there's somewhere along the line that you've displeased the Lord. Okay? Can I preach like that? I already did. So the... the um, Gentiles, they would come and encamp against them, destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents, numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out, to the Lord. It's too bad that sometimes we have to get to such a crisis point before we cry out to the Lord. Is that, that true? How many, of, how many of you came to the Lord when you were making a lot of money and uh, life was just going your way? Anybody? How many that were professors in colleges and you were just wise and you know you just got on your knees and cried out to God? It doesn't happen like that. Paul, he's not, trying to, he's not trying to put anybody down, but he goes, there's not many wise and, and lofty among you, right? But here's the good news. God chooses the base things of the world to confound the wise. Amen? And I know I had to get to a crisis point. I think one of the lowest crisis points I've seen is a, a friend of mine, and uh, he turned his life around. But he said his low point... And this guy was a, a car and motorcycle salesman that made a lot of money. But he said, my low point was when I, I came to my senses, I was snorting cocaine by candlelight because the power company had shut my lights off. How many know you might have a problem? <laughs> that you would rather have cocaine and a candle than have your power on. Sometimes we just have to get low. And Israel had gotten low. They had seven years of trouble and they're like, maybe we just need to talk to the Lord about this. Uh, my, my point came, because when I was a kid, I used to party a lot. And whenever we were partying, there was this, this weird guy that was always at the parties. He was older. And he was older than all of us. His name was Dennis Kerrigan. 
And it freaked me out. It's like, wow, that guy's awful old to be partying with us young kids and whatever. And we'd, I'd always see Dennis Kerrigan there. And I was like, I don't want to be Dennis Kerrigan when I grow up. And I was at a party. I went, somebody said there was a party. I went to this kegger party and I went there. And it was, the party was thrown by all the, the little kids. The, these were the little kids in my neighborhood when I grew up. Now they were teenagers, high schoolers. And I was at this party and I, I said, my God, I'm Dennis Kerrigan. <laughs> that was when I woke up and I said, I got to do something different here with my life. And uh, but sometimes we have to get low, but it's good if we cry out to God. Amen. So here's a cool thing. It came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the land of bondage. You know, I heard somebody recently say this and this makes so much sense that after 9-11, the churches were just filled. You remember that? The churches were filled, and a lot of people thought there was going to be a revival. And you know why there was no revival? Because there was no repentance. Our nation had gotten to a low point, but there wasn't a clear voice to say, we need to turn from our sins, or, or things are going to open up even worse than this. Do I think God sent the planes into the towers? No. But you know what? Uh, you, I remember that day, it was like the enemy got into our nation and shattered a covering. Do you remember that? I remember I went to do a job down in St. Paul and I could feel the atmosphere was just different. There wasn't the peace in the atmosphere I felt before. And if there would have been a clear prophetic voice, I believe, in, in one accord, everybody was saying different things, cut and paste in articles and whatever. If there would have been a clear voice that would have said, hey, it's time to repent as a nation. Let's repent of our sins. Let's repent of our ungodliness and wickedness. We might have seen a revival at that time. But the Lord sent a prophet to them. He reminded them of where they had come from. And then it says, I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and the hand of those who oppressed you. And I drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. They were in complete fear of them. How many know that when you're hiding in a cave, you might be in a little bit of fear, right? They were just hiding. You know, the Lord tells us who to fear in Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear them that can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul Rather, fear him that's able to kill both body and soul in hell. And Acts 5, the apostles were warned and threatened not to preach in the name of Jesus. Do you remember this? What did they do? Okay. We'll tone down our message a little bit. Sorry. Am I going to get a fine? Acts 5, the high priest asked them, saying, we did not, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. We fear God. We don't care if you're the religious leader of the times. We don't care if the whole culture is religious and the, and the, the Christians are just upstarts. We're going to obey God. So this now, when we go now to uh, 11 on for a little bit here, it's, it starts to um, go with the dialogue between Gideon and God. And I think it's so cool that wherever you're at, you should be free to have a dialogue with God. You should fear God, but you shouldn't be afraid to talk to him, right? You should always be. And you know what? With God, there's no stupid question. Have you ever asked God something? He's like, oh my, I can't believe. Do you know that the, the greatest genius, you know, have you ever worked with somebody that's like really low IQ and really hard to work with? And you're like, oh, I can't believe this. How would you like to be God, infinitely intelligent and have to work with any of us? 
I don't care if you got a PhD. God could, if he didn't have good character, go, oh, I can't believe I got to work with these people. So there's no stupid question. He does not care whatever you bring to him. And so it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree. A terebinth tree is basically an oak tree, which was in Oprah. How many knew that Oprah was in the Bible? It's Ophrah. It's not Oprah. Which belonged to Joash the Ab Abiezite. Uh, Joash is Gideon's father. While his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide from the Midianites. How many know you don't thresh wheat in a wine press unless you're basically scared and hiding? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. valor. You probably heard a lot of teachings on this. But aren't you glad that the Lord does not see us as we are? He sees us as he wants to see us, as he wants to make us into. Amen? How many can have ever had... A vision for something. How many guys have ever seen an old car and like, I could, I could make that. You know, you see it and you can see it all fixed up already, right? Or a woman might uh, see uh, a piece, I don't know how they do it, but they might see a piece of material and like, that would be a really cool decoration. And, and, and they have a vision for it. Or couples like, Anna and I, we bought, we bought a couple of, well, even when we got this church, this church Everybody compliments Anna on how beautiful it looks. This was a broken down pet store on this side. The walls, the sheetrock was rotted out on the bottom and by the grace of God and, and volunteer help, we fixed it up. But we could see that it could look like something. That's what God does when he looks at us. He's like, wow, I could make something out of that. It's up to us to just yield to him and let, us, let him do it, amen? So, uh, he says, uh, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And, and Gideon basically is saying, who me, for the next couple chapters. Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And why then are all the miracles which our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. He's like, if you're with us, if I'm this mighty man, man, man of value, why are things the way they are? Then the Lord said to him, go in this might of yours. <laughs> it's like, the Lord's not really listening to him, is he? Go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Did the, has the Lord ever given you commission to do something that you feel completely unequipped to do? No? Yeah? Maybe? Are you there? He tells Gideon, go in this might of yours. He's trying to tell him, the Lord's not with me. You know, where's, there's no miracles, nothing's going on. He's like, you're mighty. And that he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I am with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You're going to slay all the Midianites. How many know that would be hard to believe? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we look, and I was talking to Josh about this yesterday, we look at God too often as him in our image. We look at our situation, we look at our abilities, and we say, God could never do that. It's just like way too big. But we are created in God's image, not God created in our image. And we do that. We, t we take God and we put him in our image and it's like, oh, that's too hard. Hey, do you know that nothing is too impossible with God? Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is too difficult for God. We need to pray from that perspective. How many know that God, you know, we pray regularly that for our families here at Freedom Church that our extended families, our relatives will get saved. Do you know it's not 
difficult for God to send laborers into that harvest? You know, you might have lived with them and, and dwelt with them for 20, 30 years and you're like, God can't even save this person. No, it's not too difficult for God. And you ask God to send laborers, he can do it. Anything you ask, God can do. There's nothing you can ask God that he cannot do. And so the Lord's telling Gideon that he's going to deliver Israel and destroy all the Midianites as they're just one man. And so this begins Gideon starting to ask God to prove himself. And I'm just going to go through this kind of fast. But he says, uh, now in 17, if I have found favor in your sight, show me a sign that it is you who walks with me. And uh, so he says, wait here, and I'm going to prepare an offering. And God, he wanted to see if this was really God going to do something with his offering. He prepares this offering, and uh, he brings it out. He sets it on a rock, and it says, fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. How many know that that would be a sign? <laughs> you put out a meal, God turns the the rock into a Bunsen burner and the whole thing fires up and consumes the whole thing. He's like, okay, okay. And then uh, Gideon perceived that it was the angel of the Lord. Now the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, when it says the angel of the Lord, that's like pre-incarnate Christ. That's like Melchizedek. If it says an angel of the Lord, then it's probably just another messenger. <laughs> like we talked about on Wednesday night. But this was the angel of the Lord. Um, and then, uh, so he goes, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And so they go on. And the Lord, um, the, the tables kind of turn here because he was dialoguing with the Lord and he was asking the Lord to prove himself to him. Gideon was asking the Lord to prove himself to him. And now God is going to begin to ask Gideon to prove himself to God. Okay, there's a back and forth. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. His dad was a major player in the town that they came from, and his dad... Get, how far had they gotten from God in 40 years that his dad, they're Israelites, and yet he had erected this giant uh, altar to Baal. And it says, uh, take down the altar of Baal, cut down the wooden images beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement, and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. Now, that'd be a pretty scary assignment. You're going to, the Lord's asking him, tear down some of your father's property. This is the God that everybody, this is your culture. Everybody in your neighborhood, everybody in your community worships this God. Your dad owns it, and I'm going to ask you to tear it down, burn it, and take one of his, his uh, ox, which his, their ox were like their tractors, Right? So he wants him to burn, take down his idol, take one of his tractors and destroy it and burn it on the altar. How many know as a dad, you wouldn't be too happy the next day? Amen. And so uh, Gideon took 10 men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because his, he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. And I love that about Gideon. He wasn't bold, he wasn't strong yet, even though he had these promises, he was still afraid enough to do it in secret, but he did it, amen? And sometimes you're not gonna you know, boldly go and do something, but you're gonna obey God, even if privately, because it's between you and God. God asked for that thing to get done, and he did it however he knew how to do it and whatever level of faith he had, right? So he did it. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down and the wooden image that was beside it cut down, just like the Lord asked. And the second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. 
So they said to one another, who has done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. I told you counterculture has a cost, right? I mean, he might have figured that this could be the end result. It could mean the end of him if he obeyed this, but he obeyed God. Who, uh, in, the, in Revelations, doesn't it say the people that came out of the Great Tribulation loved not their lives even to death? But Joash said to all who stood against him, would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by mourning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. Therefore, on that day, they called him, Gideon, they called him Jerubbabel, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. God changed his name, or at least the community changed his name. It's, it means let God, let Baal plead. He got a new identity of a guy that was not afraid of Baal, right? And so they gave him a new name, let Baal plead. Through Gideon's faith and obedience, he turned his dad from an inf influential idolater to somebody that was defending God. Isn't that pretty cool? Do you remember when, uh, when the statue of Dagon, they put the ark in where the statue of Dagon was, the fish god? And what happened to the statue of Dagon? It fell down and they stood it back up again. I think the hands fell off at first and then it fell down again and the head fell off. And they finally figured, this ain't much of a god if we have to keep propping it up, right? The, Bi the Bible talks about the foolishness of idolatry. He goes, you guys go out in the woods you cut down a tree, you bring it back, you put it into an image, then you cover it with gold that a man has to carry around, and you worship it. Its ears can't hear, its eyes can't see, its mouth can't speak, and yet you worship this as a god. Idolish, idols are pretty foolish, right? And we're not just having images like this, we worship people, we worship money. We worship things. It's kind of foolish, isn't it? Now, because of obedience, he had gotten a reputation of somebody that didn't care what Baal thought. And so, um, go on. So, all the Midianites and Amalekites, the people all of all, all the people of the east gathered together and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So the enemy was coming in and getting close. But now the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew the trumpet and the Abiezites gathered behind him and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also gathered behind him. He sent messengers to Asher, Zebulon, Naphtali. They came up to meet him. Now instead of hiding in a wine press, He's become obedient to God. He's got a new identity of a guy that's fearless in the face of Baal. And now the spirit of God comes on him and he's rallying troops. How many could say he's growing in his faith? Amen. And uh, so uh, next part here, starting at verse 36, is, is famous fleece. How many know what a fleece is? I'm not talking about the jackets that's so popular among... A fleece is when you put something out before the Lord and see if he'll answer a question of yours. And you know what? The Lord really does answer these. Uh, a friend that I went to Bible school with, and he'll answer weird ones when you're first getting saved. For him, he, 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 it was part of the, you know, when the Jesus people movement. I don't know how this works, but God is involved in our lives. And what he, he said what he did, and God really proved himself to him, he said, Lord, if you're alive, make such and so song come on the radio. And he said he did that. 
He said God did that over and over again. How many know that's not too difficult for God? And God proved himself in that way. Now, does God have to do that? No, but he wants to do that. I've told you about the story of if I, w- I wanted to know if, if uh, tithing was real and God just opened the windows of heaven and showed me that it was real, physically in the weather. But God will do that. And um, it's part of a relationship. You... you you ha- should have a back and forth with God. You should just, not just exist. You should go back and forth with God. So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, look, I'll put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor, basically a lambskin with wool on it. If there is dew on the fleece only and is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you shall save Israel by my hand as you have said. And it was so when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. That's a bunch of dew, isn't it? But the ground was dry, but the fleece was wet. And then he said to God, don't be angry with me. (laughs) I love this. Don't be angry. I just got one more thing. I mean, you kind of want to be sure when God's asking you to go to all, all the um, Amorites and Amalekites and the Midianites and all the armies, right? He's just asking God to be sure. What does it say? Every word should be confirmed by two or three witnesses, right? So he's like, that was cool, but what if that was just a fluke? But now he gives God a harder test. He says, don't be angry with me. Just let me speak once more. Let me test, I pray thee, just once more with the fleece. Now let it be dry, only on the fleece, but all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew all over the ground. Isn't that cool? Would God do that for you? He would do that for you. Now that's just for Gideon. We should know that God... Now, I don't think that God... I think it's kind of like this. God doesn't need to demonstrate his love again to you because God demonstrate, it says God demonstrated his love in this, that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for you. He did demonstrate that. So I don't think we need to ask him all the time, show me if you love me. But you know, God loves to show us that he loves us, right? It's like, it'd be like me asking my wife, please give me a present it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that great when she gave me a present. But if she gives me a present out of the blue, it's a demonstration of her love for me. And that's how God is. Just let him demonstrate his love for you. And he wants to demonstrate his reality to you too. Amen? And so, um, I'm doing good for time. So I'm just going to go up progression of Gideon's faith walk here, okay? His first phase (laughs) was hiding. (laughs) Gideon, how's your faith coming along? I'm hiding. (laughs) Gotta start somewhere, right? What was next? He was disqualifying himself from his call. Right? I can't do it. I'm from the smallest tribe. And, you know, you got the wrong guy. How many know other Bible characters that did that same thing? Moses? I can't even, I can't even talk, right? Jeremiah? I'm just a youth. I can't do this. Isaiah? I'm a man of unclean lips, right? Peter? Ah, oh, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. None of the greats started great, amen? If you're going to be great, you might not necessarily be great now. But it's a process, or as they say in Canada, a process. Next, he started asking God to prove himself. I don't believe that God is afraid to do that, amen? God gets the glory when God proves himself, Next, he was agreeing to a dangerous assignment, even though he was afraid. Has God asked you to do something that you're afraid of doing? I dare say that you will be stuck there until you do that assignment. You're going to be stuck. 
you're going to be stuck. God's looking for people that he can count on. It was after, like I said, it was after that he did this assignment for God that he began to start moving in the power of the Spirit. We just want the power of the Spirit, but live any way we want. Next, he was assuming his identity as Jerubbabel and fearing God only. After he did that assignment. Have you assumed your new identity in Christ? It says we're kings and priests, right? We're new creation. We're more than conquerors. We have a new identity. We shouldn't identify with the old. I, sometimes I'm... It's funny, your past can stick with you a bit like blind Bartimaeus. Do you know that blind Bartimaeus can see perfectly now, but we still call him blind Bartimaeus, <laughs> right? Or, or the lady who was a prostitute but became a worshiper, she's still noted as the woman that had seven devils kicked out of her. It's like, oh, poor thing. She's a worshiper now. But we got to come into our new identity, amen? We're kings and priests, we're children of the Most High God. That should be our identity, right? And then uh, he came into flowing in the spirit and actually rallying people, rallying troops to battle. How many know that he's come a long way from the wine press? And then finally, sincerely and boldly, boldly asking God to confirm his will. That's not unreasonable with the assignment that he was given, is it? To take on all of, of, of uh, the enemy's armies. And Exodus thirty three fifteen, Moses said to the Lord, because uh, the Lord was asking him to move out, he said, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not bring us up from here. We should be like that. We should be very concerned about the Lord's will. We should be very concerned about the Lord's will. So that Moses, or, you know, Moses, like Gideon here, was just asking for the Lord's presence to go with. That's all Gideon was asking when he was asking for confirmations with the fleece and that. And uh, I'll ask you that question. Are we truly concerned about God's will? This I'll ask God about. This thing I'll ask God about. But I'm not going to ask God about that thing. Because I already know what he's going to say. Right? He was going to take away my fun on that. He wouldn't let me do that. Right? Are we concerned about what the will of God is? Are there things in our lives that we know are contrary to the word of God and yet we just assume that he'll understand? I had a business guy call me the other day. His dad died recently, so I was witnessing to him. And I'm like, you know, where are you at with the Lord, etc.? And he goes, well, the way I look at it, I like the, I let one comedian says, I might not live just right, but I'm hoping that, uh, that when I get to the pearly gates, St. Peter will say, you can come in anyway. It's like, oh, it doesn't work like that. We need to be concerned about God's will, Right? Wide is the way that leads to destruction and narrow be the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. And then, uh, so he's like, where Gideon's at, at this stage in the story, he's really concerned about God's will. But do you remember where we found him at the beginning of the story? Him and all his people were completely under oppression, depression, defeated, hiding. And now he's coming into his ministry and he just wants to know God's will. Amen? And so I don't have enough time to develop it, but next time, I mean, Gideon. Gideon turns into a regular Jehu. There's one instance where he is in pursuit of the, of the Midianites and, uh, <laughs> and these guys won't give him food. And uh, so he, he says, when I come back here, I'm going to kill you. And I'm, they, had a, they were famous for this big tower. He goes, and 
when I come back by, I'm going to knock down that tower too. And he does. But what a long way from threshing grain in the wine press to, to coming into believing what God says about him and starting to believe that he can accomplish these things that God said. I mean, he gets to be kind of a wild man. But if I ask you where you at on this spectrum, in between hiding and really being concerned about God's will, where would you put yourself on there? I know people that have been in the Lord for years and they would, they would have to say hiding. I'm afraid. If you're at the hiding stage, then maybe start obeying even though afraid. Maybe start doing the things that God has talked to you about. Do it even though afraid. Because the more that you obey God, the more power you're going to get. That's exactly what happened to Gideon. Amen? Amen. So here's my prayer for this section. And next week we're going to go into Judges 7. God help us to come out of our hiding places, grow in faith, do only your will, and begin to make a difference in our world. Amen. God, help us to come out of our hiding places and our excuses, grow in our faith, do only your will, and begin to make a difference in our world. Amen. Amen.